Good morning. Glad you all could join us today and worship with us and hear God's Word as a body of believers. Today we are continuing our uh, sermon series on the wisdom of Solomon, and today we're specifically going to be dealing with the issue of friendships. Um, and one of the things in my research I figured out is that, and you know, we probably all already know this, is that we need connections. We need friendships. It's kind of ingrained in our, uh, of who we are as people. And in fact, we often try to think that we can go it alone, but we really can't. In fact, in the studies I was doing, uh, scientific, some scientific facts that I found out is that if you have friends, close friends, you are 50% more likely to survive something like a uh, cancer or other uh, very serious illness. And it says that, in fact, you're actually less likely to get the common cold if you have close friends, is what they actually have shown through studies, because our immune systems, for whatever reason, whenever you have friends, are just naturally stronger than if you don't. It shows that we actually, our stress is reduced if we have friends, so our mental health and even our physical health, because they have tied things like heart disease and other things to stress, and our stress dramatically decreases if we have friends. It actually says that uh, you actually become more empathetic as a person, which is tied to things like compassion and things of that nature. Whenever you have friendships, it says, in fact, that the fight or flight mechanism that we have in our head is triggered just as strongly when one of our friends goes through something as if we go through it. And that's exactly what empathy is, is kind of feeling with others. It actually says that we have increased intelligence, that if you have a close network of friends, you actually uh, gain intelligence and are more likely to be a smarter person <laughs> than if you don't have friends. And all this kind of accumulates into this aspect of that if you have friends, you actually live longer. You actually have a longer, healthier life. And this doesn't go to just your overall health. It actually says that if you have friends at work, you actually are more likely to be more productive at work than if you don't have friends. There's all these things kind of tied to friendship. In fact, the studies actually tell you that you're very likely to have three very close friends and 12 kind of people within a, the, your circle of friends, but not as close. And when I read that, I found that interesting because when I read Scripture, all of a sudden you realize when you look at the life of Jesus, he had 12 friends that followed him everywhere he went. And within that 12, what did he have? An inner circle of three that were his close personal friends. And it began to make me think that it seems like even 2,000 years ago, it wasn't that different than today. Because these scientific studies are all within like the last 20 or 30 years, and yet they remain the same. And we see that, I think, even in Proverbs, that the lessons that uh, Solomon talks about with friendship and relationships are just as relevant today as they were in the days of Solomon. And that's the great thing about the Bible, isn't it? The Bible is timeless. It is relevant back then. It's relevant today because it's God's word which makes it the absolute all-encompassing truth. And it means that it will always survive and last and continue to be relevant in our daily lives. And I think this is so very true even in the aspect of friendship. Even though the world has changed around us, these lessons on friendship remain. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Proverbs. And we're going to learn a little bit first. We're going to kind of answer three questions about friendship. The first one is that uh, what is the value of friendship? The basically, why have friends? And so if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 17 is where we're going to begin today. And in Proverbs chapter 17, we see that friends are a source of love and comfort. So in chapter 17, verse 17, we see this. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. 
A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. You see, when we have friends, we know that no matter what time we're going through, in fact, Solomon talks about this in Ecclesiastes, you know, there's a time for mourning, there's a time for joy, there's a time for sorrow, there's a time for all these things. He just kind of runs through a big list of what there's a time for. He's basically saying that a friend is someone who shows love in all of those circumstances. And in that, they are providing a level of comfort for us, knowing that they will always be there loving us no matter what. And this is exactly what we need. In fact, it's often the friends that we rely on whenever we're going through those hard times. You know, yes, you have family, but often, you know, it's the family you choose over the family that you're born into. Have you heard that saying before? It's a very common saying because often you have these friends that you are in some ways more intimate with than your, even your own family that you turn to whenever you have problems. I know that there are multiple people that I turn to whenever I need wise counsel because of whatever life circumstance I'm going to. You know, one, I'll ask my wife about something because, you know, we're married and you should consult her. Two, I often ask my dad if it's something ministry related just because he's been in ministry so long. So I figure he probably knows a thing or two. But then there's... My best friend from college, who I often turn to if I'm like, I just need some advice. Or I just need to get this off my chest and let someone know about this. And the funny thing is, sometimes I'll go months without talking to him. But I know he's always there. If I need someone, he's there. Because he loves through all circumstances, through all uh, hardships and good times and bad times, no matter what there may be, he is there. And that's one of the values of friendship. The second value that Solomon points out in friendship is that friends are a source of counsel. Specifically, what we're talking about here is wise counsel, because you can get foolish counsel, but uh, friends are a source of wise counsel. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn over to Proverbs chapter 27. And in Proverbs 27, verse 9, it says, oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. See that? The sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. We rely on the counsel of friends to speak into our lives because no matter how intelligent we are, no matter how wise we are, let's face it, we don't always have it all figured out. <laughs> And we need trustworthy people around us who are going to give us good counsel, that are going to instruct us in the way to go, in the way to do things. And so we need to rely on our friends to provide that for us. In Proverbs chapter 11, it says this about the counsel of friends. Chapter 11, verse 14. It says, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. In the abundance of counselors, there is safety. We need close friends around us. Friends that are going to provide the counsel that we long for, that's going to provide the safety that we need and the instruction that we need so we can continue on and make the right decisions and know that what we're doing is what God wants. You know, if what we're trying to live by, if what a kind of, uh, uh, what, the, what we're longing for in life is to do the will of God, then we need to trust in the counsel of those around us that God has put in our lives. And so we need to trust those with wise and godly counsel. We need to trust that they are leading us in the right direction. But if we are to trust in their counsel, the question arises, how to choose friends? If we're going to have these close friends that we put our trust in, that are uh, loving us in our time of need, and then are providing counsel when we need counsel, how do we choose them? Well, fortunately for us, Solomon addresses that too. And so in Proverbs chapter 20, he kind of deals with the question of what are the types of friends you do not want? Because sometimes in order to figure out what you need, you need to first figure out what you don't need. And so in Proverbs chapter 20, Verse 19, it says this. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simple babbler. 
Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simple babbler. Now, I'll be honest. We probably all at times have unfortunately engaged in the practice of gossip. But the problem with gossip is that person is no longer trustworthy if they continue to gossip about things. And then how do you go to them for counsel if you never know if they're going to kind of keep your secrets or hold that close to chest and actually advise you correctly because they just may be looking for that next opportunity to tell someone else about it. And so the Bible is clear here. It doesn't say, uh, you know, just kind of well, be careful what you tell them. It says do not associate with that person. Do not be friends. Do not keep them in your circle at all. Why? Because they're untrustworthy. You don't know what they're going to say. And so you can't share with them the things that you need to share with them. And so we need someone who's not going to gossip, not going to uh, basically uh, share our secrets, not going to be a babbler that's going to go around and just kind of spilling things out of their mouth that they don't really know what they're saying because they're just trying to kind of tell people everything they know. And so sometimes we need someone who's going to know that we can trust that they're not going to, they're going to know when to share and when not to share about things we tell them. There's also in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24 and 25, it says, Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. You see, one of the things about having friends is they do influence us. And it's because we take their counsel. We slowly start becoming more like them, even if it's not like direct counsel where they're telling us something. There's a way they live their life that we start becoming more and more like. And so as a friend group, we need to make sure that we're not letting people in that are going to negatively impact us in a way that we shouldn't. And one of those areas is in the area of anger. Now, there is something to be said for righteous anger. There is something to be said for that. Jesus showed that when he was clearing out the temple, he had righteous anger. He showed that whenever he was talking to the Pharisees and he was saying those woe to you statements, those were very loaded, powerful, emotional statements that Jesus was making. They weren't like, oh, woe to you, Pharisees. No, he was angry with them and telling them exactly what he thought of them. There is a righteous anger, but I don't think that's what Solomon's talking about here because he's talking about it in a negative sense. I think he's more talking about when Paul kind of says, don't uh, uh, sin in your anger, don't let your anger cause you to sin. I think the problem with anger is when we're angry, we kind of lose control sometimes. And you start doing some things you know you shouldn't do. And if someone is prone to that, and I don't mean that occasionally they've messed up and got too angry. I mean, like they're prone to it where they're constantly getting angry all the time. They're short-tempered is kind of the way we would talk about it. Then you should be careful letting that person into your inner circle. Because before long, you could start having the same kind of self-control issues. And before long, you start struggling with that. And before long, you start sinning in your anger. And so we have to be careful about who we let in to become our friends. And so if you know someone who's very short-tempered, then you shouldn't be friends with them. It's not worth it. And then Proverbs 25, verse 18 and 19 It says, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club, a sword, or a sharp arrow. Trusting in a treacherous man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. This kind of gets back to that uh, issue of the, uh, how do we, like having good counsel? You know, how can we trust someone if they're constantly blabbing what we tell them. And this is that thing. If they're constantly lying or uh, bearing false witness, if they're proving that they're untrustworthy, then they actually do more damage than good. I don't know if any of you have ever had a bad tooth pain. I have uh, unfortunately have. And there is not much I can think of that is more painful. 
And it's, I'm sure there are things that are more painful, but it's like, with, at least with myself, and I can't speak for everyone here, whenever I've had bad tooth pain, because I've had a, a wisdom tooth one time that cracked and then got infected and I didn't know it because I have a large mouth so my wisdom teeth could grow in, but it didn't grow in right. And it was, I was having trouble even making words come out of my mouth because it's like my brain stopped functioning because of the pain in my mouth. And so it's like this, comes this moment where you're like, I don't know how I'm going to continue to live with this. <laughs> in fact, I even remember one time when I was an assistant manager at a pizza place, I had a, a I I've, have a history of bad teeth problems, unfortunately, but uh, uh, I had an abscess tooth and I was trying to work and I had worked there for quite a while as assistant manager. I knew exactly what went on pizzas. I was having trouble remembering just like went on some of our most basic pizzas all because of a tooth pain. <laughs> so eventually my manager who was there at all there as well was like, Nathan, I think you just need to go home. <laughs> I don't think you're actually beneficial for us here tonight. <laughs> and so I went home and got some ibuprofen and took it and it felt a little better. Went to the dentist the next day <laughs> because that's what you have to do to get rid of it. It's the same thing here. If you have an untrustworthy friend, it's going to cause a lot of pain in your life. It's going to cause a lot of problems. So it means that whenever we're trying to choose what kind of friend we have, we need to make sure they're trustworthy, that they're not short-tempered, that they're not gossiping and spilling your secrets. And so we can look and kind of eliminate certain people in our lives of being in that network of friends just by looking at what not to have. But then Solomon's very clear. He points out one major thing of what are the types of friends you want. And you, know, you expect him to give like this whole list, but he really centers in on one thing that you want in a friend. Proverbs chapter 13 Chapter 13, verse 20, has this to say. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Who should your friends be? The wise. Now, it's very important to remember the whole book of Ecclesiastes is kind of centered around this thought, where do we find value? Where do we find worth in life? And he ends with, true wisdom is only found in God. And obeying his word. Everything else is meaningless. And so we have a lot of these aspects of what wisdom is in our culture, but that's not the wise he's talking about here. In fact, Paul says that the wisdom of Christ will be de deemed foolishness by the world. The wise Solomon is talking about here is Scripture. Someone who's living their life according to God's will. And the overarching, the biggest aspect of a friend, if you're choosing a friend, is are they living their life according to God? To God's will? Are they looking at scripture and saying, that's how I want to model my life. I am trying, striving to be more like Christ by looking at scripture and seeing what God wants for my life. And so as we're going through kind of our evaluation of who our friends are and what kind of friends we should have, we see that what we should have is someone who's dedicated to God and trying to be wise in the eyes of God. And that means following scripture. And this doesn't really matter by what your age. If you're an adult, you should be trying to find friends that fit this mold. If you're a teenager, try to find friends that meet, meet this mold. If you're in your 80s, try to find friends that fit this mold. It doesn't matter what your age. This is what our inner circle of friends should be. This is what our even outer circle of friends should be. We see that with even Jesus. His friends were the people that were dedicated to him, following after him, and he was God. He was telling them what it was to obey God. And what did they over and over do? They wanted to please God. And yes, there was one who eventually turned away, as we know. But for the most part, his disciples were trying, striving 
to fit their life in tune with what God wanted them to be. Did they fail at times? Just like we all fail at times. But that was their longing. That was what they were pursuing. That's where they were finding meaning in life. And that's what we should be searching for as well. But choosing friends isn't the whole issue, is it? Yes, we can address the how do you choose friends, but then you actually have to maintain that friendship. And so the question uh, is brought up how to maintain those friendships. How do we make sure that those friendships last? Well, and the, and the first thing is I want to say is uh, uh, Solomon addresses this by partially pointing back to those uh, types of friends you don't want. And so those still remain if your friends start gossiping or start, start becoming short-tempered or start becoming untrustworthy, then those are people probably that you want to not maintain. You want to kind of shed those friendships if you can. And, but then there's also this uh, other disruptions to avoid, friendship disruptions to avoid. And one of them is found in Proverbs chapter 17, which if you remember, Proverbs chapter 17, just three verses after this is actually where it says that friends are uh, the source of love. They show us love. And so he says in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14, it's three verses before. He says, the beginning of strife is like letting out water. So quit before the quarrel breaks out. You see, one of the things we need to avoid is these senseless arguments these little strifes and quarrels that kind of come up in life. And if you have someone who's constantly kind of starting these arguments in your life, then they need to be addressed. It needs to be dealt with. And, you know, maybe you can deal with it within that friendship and fix that, or maybe that needs to be cut out. Another area in chapter 27, chapter 27, verse 14 it actually says, whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, will be counted as cursing. Specifically, what he's saying here is that the person who's blessing his neighbor with a loud voice, he's talking about insincerity. Someone who's going around and, yeah, they puff you up real good, but it's not meant. It's empty. And basically that kind of puffing you up, that insincere uh, acknowledgement and uh, compliments, they might as well just be cursing you because it's not helping in any way. And so sometimes these uh, disruptions, they constantly kind of pump you up, but it doesn't really help you. It actually causes a lot of times more harm than good. It reminds me of, I, I used to, the first couple of seasons of American Idol I used to watch. I haven't seen it since and I don't really watch a lot of those shows. But I remember when I watched the first two seasons of American Idol, one of the things that always struck me was there'd be these people going on and they clearly could not sing. And they were used for entertainment, which always rubbed me a little wrong because while, yes, they were singing, but I kind of felt bad for the person. But then I also realized that it wasn't always their fault because often those people that went on there and thought they could sing, as soon as they left, they had this group of family and friends that basically told them how amazing they were and how great of a singer they were. And you're just like thinking like, I'm sure they're good at something that you could compliment. We all have gifts that we have. Yet you've falsely puffed them up in an area where they're now, it's like a curse. You've basically embarrassed them in front of all these people by continuing to offer these empty words to them. And I'm not saying be harsh with them and be like, you should never sing, you are horrible, please do not. That's not what I'm saying, do. But that doesn't mean you constantly tell them, hey, you're the best singer I've ever heard, you should definitely do that. And then they go on American Idol, and I'm like, are these people, they just don't know what singing is? Or are they hoping that maybe they don't get put on TV or something like that? Because, like, how do they not know that they're not a good singer? And I just kind of feel sorry for the person going up there and singing. And it's kind of sad. And it started with that insincerity. However, that's not the end of it. Because sometimes those disruptions, while, yes, they're problems, they can be fixed. I alluded to this a little bit earlier. And so sometimes we need to understand that in order to maintain a relationship, we need to learn how to solve problems in friendships. How do we solve problems in the friendships? How do we fix the issues? 
Unfortunately for us, Solomon addresses this as well. In chapter 16, verse 7, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You see, if disruptions are causing issues in your relationship, and so there's like that lack of peace, one of the ways that we can make sure that we're uh, getting that peace back in our relationship is by making sure that our ways are at peace with God. Because we know that friendships, that counsel rubs off on each other. And if our ways are at peace with God, then we know that it will start filtering out into them. And it even says that our enemies will start to be at peace with us. And if our enemies are beginning to be at peace with us, you got to believe that our close friends will start becoming at peace with us as well. So often we often kind of think of whenever we have a problem with someone else, that it's their problem, like they're the ones at fault. But maybe the first step that we need to do is, are we at peace with God? Are we striving to be wise in the eyes of the Lord? Are we looking at it and saying, I am good with God where I'm at? That should be the first step. And if we have addressed that, then we can start moving on to other things. And another thing that we can do is Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10, verse 12. And there it says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So we see that what we are to do is to be at peace with God. And then the next thing, it doesn't say, then go and make sure they know what they've done wrong. What does it say next? Love covers up offenses. If you want to deal with and maintain a friendship and solve problems within a relationship, then what you need to do is show love. You're making sure you're at peace with God, and then you show love to that person. And if you're doing those things, it's amazing how things start working out. And so we can look at, you know, Corinthians 13, where the love chapter, where it says, love is this, love is this. And we start realizing, okay, I need to be doing these things before I start basically complaining about someone else. Or I need to make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing before I start causing other issues. And so we show love. And then sometimes there is a little more required. And in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 23, it says, whoever rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with his tongue. Notice the kind of things they're comparing here. You got the one who flatters, which that's kind of that insincerity. They're telling you things that don't really mean anything. Or the one who rebukes, which is seen as a positive here. Now, it's important to know that uh, I don't think rebuking is the first step in all of this. It's also important to know that, you know, Paul says in the New Testament that we should always speak the truth in love. And so if you're rebuking, make sure that you're coming from love first and that you're saying it in love and doing it in a loving way, because otherwise it's probably not going to be heard well. But it says that sometimes we do need to rebuke. Because sometimes even if we're at peace with God, we know we're doing the right thing. Sometimes even though we're showing that person love in our friendship, sometimes they're still doing something wrong. And so sometimes you do need to call them on it. It's part of what being a Christian brother and sister is all about is we are called to call other people out whenever they need correction. In fact, the Bible often refers to this, that uh, we are not really called to tell non-Christians where they're sinning, yet we're really good at that. We are often called to tell Christians where they're sinning, yet we're really bad at that. (laughs) Yet that's what the Bible says. And so sometimes we need to make sure that if we want to maintain these friendships, if you're seeing in your life, I'm having trouble finding relationships and maintaining those relationships, we need to look at these things. Are we at peace with God? Are we doing what we can to show that person love? And 
do we tell them the truth even when it's hard? But remember that we don't negate those first two when we're telling them the truth. We continue to make sure we're at peace with God, showing them love, and then telling them where there might need some correction. And if we do this, if that friendship is one that should be there, that you should have in your life, then it should begin to mend and be maintained and the problem should start being solved. But my encouragement to you is this. First, look inward before you start focusing outward. Because that's what we see in Scripture. And if we're constantly trying to find meaning in life and where it is that God wants us to be, then we rely on Scripture. That is wisdom. And one of the hardest things to do in life, and studies also say this, for adults, especially adults with young children, is to basically have friends. But we see in Scripture a way that we can do that and the importance of that. And so as we leave here today, I encourage you to look at your own friendship circles. Look at who should be your friend and who should not be your friend. But also look at yourself and are you being the friend that we see here? Because we are called to be that friend as well. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. We are so thankful that your word is still so relevant today as it was thousands of years ago. And I pray that we rely on your wisdom and we focus on what your word says. That way we can be who we know you want us to be and find meaning where you prescribe meaning to be. Pray this in your son's name. Amen.